and welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss mystical works of literature and how they relate to recovery. We hope you enjoy today's podcast episode. Hello, this is Buddy C. Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. Today we have Lori and Brian and Drew. Good to have you guys today. Any announcements, go to BuddyC.org. Lots of good things there for you. A lot of resources. Um, Take advantage of that if you're so inclined. Let's get on to the 50th verse of the Tao Te Ching. Who would like to read for us today? Um, How about, Drew, you want to read Stephen Mitchell? Sure. The master gives himself up to whatever the moment brings. He knows that he is going to die and he has nothing left to hold on to. No illusions in his mind, no resistances in his body. He doesn't think about his actions. They flow from the core of his being. He holds nothing back from life. Therefore, he is ready for death, as a man is ready for sleep after a good day's work. Thank you, Drew. Brian, you have Derek Lynn? I do. Coming into life, entering death. The followers of life. Three and ten, the followers of death, three and ten, those whose lives are moved towards death, also three and ten. Why? Because they live lives of excess. I've heard of those who are good at cultivating life. Traveling on the road, they do not encounter rhinos or tigers. Entering into army, they are not harmed by weapons. Rhinos have nowhere to thrust their horns. Tigers have nowhere to clasp their claws. Soldiers have nowhere to lodge their blades. Why? Because they have no place for death. Hmm. Thank you, Brian. Lori, would you read Jonathan Starr? Indeed. Verse 50. Again and again, men come in with birth and go out with death. One in three are followers of life. One in three are followers of death. And those just passing from life to death also number one in three. But they all die in the end. Why is this so? Because they clutch to life and cling to this passing world. I hear that one who lives by his own truth is not like this. He walks without making footprints in this world. Going about, he does not fear the rhinoceros or tiger. Entering a battlefield, he does not fear sharp weapons. For in him, the rhino can find no place to pitch its horn, the tiger, no place to fix its claw, the soldier, no place to thrust his blade. Why is this? Because he dwells in that place where death cannot enter. Thank you, Lori. Hmm. Any comments, guys, at this point? My interpretation of this, verse 50, titled, Dying to Live. All who have drawn a breath abide in one of these categories. About a third live cautious, uneventful lives. About a third are self-destructive, reckless, and overindulgent. About a third start out living a full life, then unknowingly they're overtaken by fear. A small fraction find a way of living that frees them from the fear of death. How is this possible? They have already died. When I was pinning this, my wife thought I was wasting my time. I could just tell the way she was coming. When I got to this one, I I brought it upstairs and said, read this. She stood there and started reading it and looked at me and read more and looked at me and read more. She said, this is good. I said, did you not think it was going to be good? She said, no, I didn't. <laughs> I thought you were wasting your time. Buddy, is that? What? The, sorry. The, the three and ten, is that is that another way of saying a third? Yes. That That's what the, the machinist did me. <laughs> yeah. you know? It's like yeah. a third are doing one thing that's going to lead in the wrong direction. And there's one out of 10 who is different. I think that's yeah. the, the gist of it. Um, I like the way that Jonathan, that 
Stephen Mitchell starts this, though. I, I think this is one of the big keys to finding your way to the one. Finding your way to being the one. That's a good title. I'm going to write that down. The master gives himself up to whatever the moment brings. The rest of this, I think, is just describing how you do that. Because isn't that the whole point of all spirituality is to surrender to the present moment? That's everything. That's where acceptance is for us recovery folks. Was it acceptance is solution to all of our problems today? Because you can only accept right now. Whatever the moment brings, you give yourself up to that moment. Because the more we fight, the more we resist, the less we're giving ourselves up. Now, that doesn't mean that we roll over and do nothing. See, that's the difference. It's not talking about, oh, we're powerless, but we're not helpless. There's a difference between helplessness and powerlessness. And what we find, and that's why I love the Tao, is it demonstrates for us the way of powerlessness, the way of surrender. So giving yourself up to the moment, then you're able to move past that and really see with more spiritual eyes and hear with more spiritual ears because you're not fighting the moment anymore. And all spiritual practices, we've talk, I've talked about this tons of times, are bringing us to the moment. We're, we're told, and I, I believe this, that God is love. That's a verse out of 1 John. I actually believe that if they would have realized what that meant, they would have took it out. Because that's actually saying that God is not a person, that God is a, an action. If God is love, it doesn't say God loves. But God is actually the act of love. And what? when can you show compassion in any way? It's right now. You can't do that in the future. You do that in the, that's what, I think that's why in recovery we're told that nothing works uh, as immunity against a drink as intensive work with another alcoholic. It works when other activities fail. That's because what I am doing is I am coming to the moment by being helpful to you. What ways have you guys, you've maybe not framed it in these words, but have you realized yourself giving up to the moment in different ways? Does that resonate with y'all? Because that can be framed in so many different ways. It's interesting. It says he gives himself up to whatever the moment brings. not. We think, I think of bad things. If I, because when I'm not accepting something as it is, I, I suffer. I also suffer when I don't give myself up to good things because I can make my plans and spin whatever's going on, either good or bad. And when I start doing that and getting out of the moment, I start losing my peace and joy. But you can say what you want to, and I, I hear this said. You know, I do want to be happy all the time. Anyone that says they don't is full of shit. I really believe. <laughs> and you can say, oh, that means being acceptance, not happiness. Peace and joy. You could say that if you want to, but it's all saying the same thing. I, I want to be in a place that I'm content and happy with life. That doesn't mean that I'm everything is to my approval. If I'm giving myself up to the moment, only then can I see if there's something I can change in the next moment. It's not saying I approve. It's just saying that I accept. That's different things. That's not the same thing. I, I know that meditation really helps me with that. Not necessarily the act itself, the practicing of it. That lets me, when I'm in a situation where I know that I'm I'm trapped in my thoughts. That's what always takes me out of the moment is just being uh, in, engaging with my thoughts. If I'm out in the local nature preserve or hanging out with friends or just eating dinner or even mowing the yard or something, if I catch myself just in, in conversation with my thoughts, just getting in a, a, a negative thought loop or 
resentful thought loop, selfish thought loop, something like that, then what meditation does is helps me bring me to the moment and realize, hey, I'm I need to I, I can let all this go. I can I can let these thoughts pass on their own. I can just enjoy being in this nature preserve, looking at things without without thinking about what I've got to do tomorrow or what somebody did yesterday or what I did 10 years ago or anything like that. I can just, I can look at these flowers. I can look at these butterflies, appreciate them. I can be with my friends and you know, appreciate being with them. I can mow the yard and appreciate <laughs> that I'm mowing the yard and feel the sun on me. So that that's one of my, one of my tactics for getting back into the moment is just recognizing, okay, I'm having these thoughts that are taking me out. Let's now is not the time for this. Put those aside and just focus on what I can sense right now, what I'm seeing, what I'm smelling, what I'm hearing, and appreciate what's going on around me. You mentioned gratitude as well, Drew. That, that's a tool I use for that. Mm -hmm. I, I can only show gratitude right now. Hmm. So of the three different types, buddy, which do you, how, how would you describe them? So three seem born to live, born to die, and then three live lifely or deathfully. So we're focusing on the one, which is fine. We're, odds are good we're in the other groups. Is it like a positive thing focused on living, focused on death or negative things, like positive, negative, and then I'm just curious what you, how yeah. you describe uh, oh. the three different groups. Yeah, I was going there eventually. Thank you. <clears throat> I do want to mention one other thing before we do. Mitchell goes and Mitchell looks at these a lot of times different. He won't have, he won't follow the text exactly. Um, he just goes with what he's inspired. I, I heard an interview, watched an interview with him about this. He took some literary license with his, translation but his very next sentence it seems odd that he goes from the master gives himself up to whatever the moment brings he knows that he's going to die <laughs> wait a minute that's a big why, why do you go there immediately <laughs> he knows that he's going to die and he has nothing left to hold on to no illusions in his mind no resistance in his body he doesn't think about his actions. They flow from the core of his being. And the only way he can do that is by giving himself up to what the moment brings. And, and I think Stephen Mitchell's translation really is a description of the one, not the nine. Um, they flow, for, uh, his actions flow from the core of his being. He holds nothing back from life. Therefore, he's ready for death as a man is ready for sleep after a good day's work. Now, Y'all just interrupt me if you have something. Let's talk about the, the three different types. Uh, each say this a little differently, um, but there are three different types that are traps. For me, in, in my, I didn't translate this, more of an interpretation. This was my conclusion with that. The first third are cautious and, and they, have, they lead uneventful lives. I looked at all the, what those different words could mean. And that was my, what I concluded. The different translations say it different ways. Three, in, the followers of death, three and 10, those who, whose lives, okay. They live also three, hold on. Just their lives are moved toward death is how Derek Lynn said that. Three out of 10 celebrate life. And it doesn't say a whole lot about it. The way I looked at that was they were just cautious. They didn't take risks. They were just, you know, they just live life. Pretty uneventful. Still some fear there, though, I would think. I think all three of these are an element of fear. Then the there, second there third. A, what? Just going to say, there was a, that reminds me of a phrase I heard growing up in heavily Baptist town, frozen chosen. Yeah. Uh, the people who believe they're going to heaven, but they're they're frozen in their actions because they don't want to do anything that might that might anger God, that might 
send them down to hell. They're living their lives, but very cautious of not doing anything to to maybe put them at risk of anything in the afterlife. You know, and I know people who live very cautious lives. They don't take any risks in their investing. They don't do anything that's out of the ordinary. It's everything is calculated and planned and cautious. And we can also look for a spiritual parallel to each of these three as well. Not just a physical, because when we're talking about going to die, we also are talking about dying to self as part of this. Then the second third I have are self-destructive, reckless, and overindulgent. You can put my name beside You could say the second third's like buddy. <laughs> yeah, that's me. And that makes sense. You've got your cautious. You've got your overindulgent. Then the third set I have is starting out living a full life and then unknowingly are overtaken by fear. So living along, living a good life. But at some point, you go in one of those other directions because fear can take you in both of those directions. You just go in an overindulgent direction or a very cautious direction. You're not, either way, you're not living a full life. So you're starting out well and then you, fear and then the one out of 10 the one that i think stephen mitchell described that gives himself up to the moment continually find a way of living that frees them from the fear of death like oh yeah that's it how many of my decisions are based out of fear that i think that's what that's addressing can i live free of fear i think that's what it's talking about only one out of 10 lives free of fear. All those others are a form of fear. Some more overt, some not. But you can see fear behind those. And how can the one of the 10 live free of fear? Because they've already died to self. They surrender their expectations. Yes. They give up to whatever the moment brings. Yep. They realize they got all of what they need and some of what they want, and they're okay. I had a an affirmation I used for a while. What was it? Only want what I have, only have what I want. Yeah. Hmm. Those things sometimes pop up, like Drew was talking about meditation. Those things pop up sometimes. Yeah. We can't do this if we're still, if I'm still looking for a way to promote Buddy. I cannot surrender to what this moment brings because if it's not promoting me, I want to change it. So I'm no longer in the moment. I'm out there in the future somewhere spinning it, trying to. That statement in recovery, be where your feet are. Y'all hear that in in some of y'all's meetings? Yeah. Be where your feet are. That's so huge. All comes down to accepting life on life's terms. Yes. Regardless. Regardless. Easy to do when things are going good. Well, what we do is this, though, Brian. Even when things are good, if we're not careful, we won't accept either because we're busy trying to orchestrate things to keep being the way that we want them. Yeah. The whole point of acceptance is that we can have peace and joy regardless of whether things are perceived good or bad. Yeah. They don't have to be good for us to have peace and joy, nor do they have to be bad for us not to? I saw a quote the other day, and I don't remember where I ran across it, but it said something about, remember, today will be one of the good old days. I just saw that same quote, Brian. That's really strange. Yeah. That's funny. But I don't remember it? where I ran across it. Yeah, it was yeah, like a banner or something somewhere. Huh. I don't know if you guys are curious, but this other book I have... Um, from Ralph Allen Dale has got a commentary in the back. Good, good. And uh, so what is that when we say environment versus genetics? What do you call that? That's a big debate about how you live life. Anyway, so he says Chinese medicine identifies two main sources of, of, of key vital energy that determine our ability to survive adversity. The force is, first is called Wan. I'm not pronouncing it right, probably genetic 
key. It's the vital energy we inherit from our parents. So that's the genetic one. The second is called acquired key. It's a vital energy that derives from our lifestyle. And that's from the air we drink, the food we eat, our environment, um, how we relate to the emotions and actions through which we relate to our environment. So he's saying the four kinds are differentiated here according to the life force which protects them or their death force, which threatens them. So the first one are born to live. These are the three of 10 who uh, Lao Tzu identifies as having inherited a strong one key from their parents. So a genetic tendency towards, I think of them as like old souls. They, they're not as swept up automatically by all the bullshit that goes on in life. And then there are those who seem to have been born to die because they have not seem not to have selected their parents so wisely, which is interesting and incorporates the idea of reincarnation. In other words, their environment more dictates. And then the third type, those whose choice of lifestyle determines whether they live fully or deathfully, those who lead a lifestyle that supports their vital energy, uh, thereby facilitates their own health and longevity. Those who lead a lifestyle that challenges and insults their vital energy weakens their health and invites an early death. So those are the three kinds. So they choose. They maybe go back and forth between the two. And then lastly are those who seem to be impervious to harm and premature death because they live in harmony with others, with the universe, and with themselves. This, of course, is living in great integrity. Today, although we may be fortunate in inheriting a strong genetic key and we might choose our lifestyle relatively wisely, we cannot entirely, we cannot live entirely because of our, the great integrity, because our social environment is more or less a contradiction <laughs> to the great integrity. I kind of agree that's with a, that. That's a, yeah, that's an overstatement at the moment. That's right? not an overstatement at the moment. This contradiction is manifested in most of our institutions. Family, work, religion, schooling, sports, leisure, politics, economics, medical care, and whatever. Since we are all social beings, we cannot avoid growing up in the womb of these predominantly corrupt institutions. The nearest we can come to living the great integrity is by rejecting many of their values, premises, and behaviors. I think of that as relearning. Even if we're gifted with in, intuitively the ability to avoid the tiger's claw and the rhinoceros's horn, and the soldier's blade, we have to unlearn a lot of stuff, which is brilliant. And I think you're right. It is fear. A lot of that stuff that those institutions are promoting is fear-based. Hey, hey Lori, could it be that the uh, tiger's claw and the rhinoceros's horn and the soldier's blade are not talking about physical claws, horns, and blades? Yeah, mental, emotional. Yes, all all the we're talking about a spiritual surrender, not a physical one. Physical, right? Yeah, I agree. So I thought that was interesting. Yes. And it's good to have some more, some of some other commentary with this because it does fit. It does fit. So how can we be the one, not the nine? <laughs> because. It doesn't matter which one of the three sets you are. It doesn't matter. You're still not accepting what the moment brings. You're not in a place of peace and joy. I only find peace and joy when I do accept the moment as it is. And then the serenity prayer can apply. Mm -hmm. I can't see what needs to be changed or what can't be changed until I accept it more as what it is. I never see it 100% like it is, but I do, I'm getting closer to that. Yeah, and I'm with Drew. I think I'm, I, meditation is the one tool that I can use consistently. And now I don't have to sit and stare at something or sit and have my eyes closed. I can pretty much go into it and be an observer. That's what it means for me to meditate is to flip from being engrossed in the moment to being observing the moment and being in that higher being and not being attached, being detached. That's what meditation is created for me, the ability to flip that switch. And that is 
like Eckhart Tolle says, allows me to accept, enjoy, or enthuse at any given moment instead of being wrapped up in wanting to change it, control it, be upset about it, make it different. Yeah. It's that pause oh. button. The pause. Yeah. The, the physical act of meditation is a trainer. It's not an end-all, be-all. It is pointing us to where we can be at that same place like you're talking about, Lori, that place of observance when we're not on the cushion. When we're driving, can we bring our attention back to what we're doing? How about try this? Try watching TV meditatively, which would mean you put your phone down you watch what you're watching and you keep bringing your attention back to the screen whenever it wanders. That is so difficult. Or for me, it is. And I realized I could, it's a form of meditation for me to do that. Now, if I've been meditating a lot, like just came back from a retreat or something, it's easy. But in my daily practice, as it goes on away from those times of extended meditation, it becomes more difficult. Sometimes I have to take a little more time. And uh, someone asked me, how long do you need to meditate? So for me, I need to meditate until I want to meditate more. <laughs> if I want to stop and get up, oh, I'm glad the, the alarm went off. I'm finished. Buddy, I was reading this commentary about the fourth type that, that one left, and it says, such people live in moderation that they do not shrink from unfamiliar, but they are also not full heartedly. They are skillful players, not spectators in the game of life. They fully engage in their interactions with the world. Hmm. It's that stand where your feet are. Yes. That could also be knowing when to let that, knowing when to let the, the mud settle. Yes. Knowing when to pause. Knowing when I'm forcing my way uphill. And the reverse would be going where you're being pushed. That one is has really been my friend Claire. Uh, when I first started studying the Tao, she mentioned that in a meeting to go where you're being pushed. I'm like, oh, that's great. And that's really the truth. How can mm -hmm. we see where we're being pushed if we're resisting all pushing? We can't. And I was also thinking about the story from the New Testament about the sower sow, sowing the seed in different soils. This kind of resonated, that story resonated with me. This is from Matthew 13, start in verse 3. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. So they grew quickly because they weren't in a good place. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up and choked them. It was good earth, but there were thorns there too, so it choked them out. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some hundred, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I think that idea of having ears, unless I'm giving myself up to the moment, I'm not able to hear these things. I'm amazed at the times that something's mentioned and but yet it takes me 10 or 15 times of it being mentioned before i realize what's being said because i wasn't ready to hear it i think that's why we're around truth and we don't hear the truth is because we're not able to hear it yes i read a quote the other day that was talking about the reason you have one mouth and two ears is you need to speak half as much as you do listening we have one mouth and two ears for a reason. Yeah. I never read that. That's good. Any other comments? This is really about dying to self is what this whole verse in my thinking is about. Surrendering the will and ego. Yeah. Third step. 
which I think is the point of the whole program, is how do we turn our will and life and cares over? How we surrender to those? How we give ourselves up to whatever the moment brings? What a great way to phrase that. So my job is to give up to the moment. Mm -hmm. The way I phrase that sometimes is I open my heart to what is. Because I can find myself closing off. When things aren't the way I want, I'll close off. Michael Singer talks about this a lot. I just close up. And when I do, I'm starting to resist and push. When if instead I can, even if it's something that I don't like at all, if I can open my heart, say, can I see this differently? My friend Karen Casey, can I see this differently? Course in Miracles. How can I see this differently? That's giving myself up to the moment. That's good. Anything else, guys? It's been a good conversation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, buddy. You're very good. If, if this were a practice that anyone wanted to start, I would suggest sitting quietly. Maybe start with the mantra, I am open to giving myself up to whatever the moment brings. And see where that takes you. See where that takes you because it's about being open. I told you a story about being angry. And but I, the way I opened myself up to that moment was I am angry at whoever. Because that was the moment I was in. And why I was angry. And you know what? Before I knew it, instead of me pushing against that moment, I found it just leaving. Like within a few minutes, a few 30 seconds, 60 seconds. It was almost immediate when I would have in the past been angry all afternoon. I still react to traffic sometimes. On the way back, a guy wouldn't let me in. I told him he was number one yesterday, but within 10 seconds, I was praying for him. <laughs> Instead of holding that off and running up on his ass and just being a butt, I just said, Does it happened once. And I was like, oh, okay. And I got over it and took corrective action much faster. That's the progress. That's the progress. Yeah. Guys, thank y'all for being here today. We hope to see you next week. Have a fantastic week. Thank you. Hello, this is Buddy C. I wanted to make you aware of several recovery-related resources that I've posted in the episode description. These resources include a list of recovery podcasts, a free sober meditation app, daily recovery email, shared Google recovery calendars. Hope you put some of these resources to use and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends in recovery.